It is now my pleasure to introduce the first talk of our program, which will be presented by Dr. Henry Trey Winter III. Trey is an astrophysicist who studies how energy is released in the sun's atmosphere, the corona. He has worked on eight NASA missions dedicated to observing the sun. Trey is very committed to science education and has designed exhibits that bring the wonder and beauty of the sun and the universe to the public. His exhibits have been featured at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the National Air and Space Museum, and the Harvard Art Museums, among others. Dr. Winter is currently a core team member of NASA's Space Science Education Consortium and is working on cutting edge technologies to make astrophysics accessible to people who are blind and visually impaired. Today, he will discuss the significance of solstices from the Stone Age to the Rocket Age. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Trey Winter, and I'm a scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And I study the sun for a living, which I think is amazingly exciting and a lot of fun. And I'm also very glad to be here with you today celebrating the, sum uh, the summer solstice. The summer solstice is a time where we mark the height of summer, one of the, the longest day of the entire year, and we want to celebrate that. And I am here to tell you a little bit about why the solstice occurs and why it's still important today as it was many, many years ago. So first off, we, if we're gonna celebrate the solstice, we need to know what a solstice actually is. Now, if you are able to track the sun as it moves across the day sky, you would see that some days of the year at noon, it gets up to a certain height in the sky. And then other days at noon, it gets a little bit higher and then it reaches a maximum point. And then other days at noon, it go, starts to go lower. So what we call a solstice is a day where the sun at noon is either at the highest point or the lowest point in its arc as it goes from east to west across your sky. Now, a friend of mine has taken this picture and this is, a picture of the sun on three different days, and each one of the little images on the sun represents a different hour that he took a picture of the sun. So the very top pictures of the sun was from a, a summer solstice. And you can see that the sun has gotten very high in the sky. The bottom arc of images of the sun are from a winter solstice. And you can see that as the day progresses, the sun never gets quite as high in the sky as it did during the summer solstice. So what's that in the middle? Well, those images in the middle are taken during an equinox. So we have a solstice, right, when the sun either gets to the highest point or lowest point in the sky, and those represent the longest day for the summer and the shortest day and the winter of the year. The equinox represents two times in a year where the suns are, where the days are, and nights are about even, right? They're about equal, about 12 hours each. And that's what we show here in the middle. So we've got the summer solstice, images of the sun on the top, and then we've got uh, images of an equinox in the middle, and then way down low, we have images of the winter solstice, right? So we're celebrating today the longest day of the year, marking that summer is here, and now the days are actually gonna start getting sh shorter and shorter, until we get to the fall or vernal equinox when the days are about even again. Now, marking time in this way was very, very important, especially to ancient cultures. And the reason why is that during, uh, for ancient cultures, right, they did not have supermarkets. They had to figure out when to hunt, when to plant, and when to harvest crops. And they built lots of different tools to do what my friend did with uh, photography, right? They didn't have, uh, cameras, they didn't have the stands and technology that he did to be able to take those pictures of the sun. So they figured out all these different and interesting ways in order to determine when a solstice was coming and when an equinox was coming. And that's the way that they could actually measure out their years and know when to plant and when to harvest. Now, a lot of people think that Stonehenge, part of its purpose was to actually determine some of these events like a solstice or an equinox but there's still a lot of debate and people are still talking about it and are not quite sure. And you can uh, listen to a talk later on today as part of the uh, Celebrating Solstice program about a person talking about Stonehenge and taking you through a tour. All right, so the question becomes then why are days different lengths, right? Why does sometimes the sun appear to get higher in the sky or lower in the sky? 
And there's a series of clues that you can actually follow to determine why this is so. And one of those clues that you can start looking at is the fact that there is a North Star, all right? So there is a star, if you look up towards the North, it's called Polaris. And we call it the North Star because if you were to, to take a picture, right? And a camera works by opening a shutter and closing it really quickly. If you are able to keep that shutter open for a long period of time and see how the stars moved in the night sky, right? The stars, just like the sun, rise in the east and set in the west. But if you could watch them rising and setting, you'd see that they actually make an arc around the night sky. And they actually all circle around a central part, a central point. And that central point here in the northern hemisphere is called the North Star or Polaris. And this is an image of uh, time-lapse photography showing how the stars move around the night sky and you have in the background an aurora borealis. These are the northern lights that kind of give off this faint green glow as particles hit our atmosphere from the sun. And you can see that they're all swirling around that point. Well, now this isn't unique to this one place or this one photograph. If you go to several different places along the Earth, you can actually take these same types of photographs and you can see that the stars are always swirling around that North Star. But in this picture, you can see that the part, uh, the North Star where all the stars are swirling around is actually closer to the horizon or to the ground, right? It's not as high up in the sky. And that's because we've actually changed our location. We've moved um, further south. So why is it that all these things are happening and what does this have to do with there being a solstice? Well, if the days are longer and shorter, you might think it's because of how the Earth moves around the sun, because the Earth does orbit around the sun just like all of the other planets. And as the Earth orbits around the sun, right, we, uh, at different points, it takes one year for the Earth to orbit around the sun, right? And one year we have summer and winter and all of our seasons. So you might think it has to do with the Earth moving around the sun, but that's not quite true because as the Earth moves around the sun, it is almost a complete perfect circle as it goes around the sun. So the Earth never gets really that much closer to the sun or that much farther away, right? What the reason why the sun appears to move in the sky at, at different days, at different parts of the year, is because the Earth is actually tilted with respect to the sun and it is constantly spinning. Now, when I say spinning, the Earth is actually spinning just like a top spins. Now, if you've ever played with a top in the past, you know that if the top is just lying there, it'll fall flat and just lie on the table. But if you give it a spin, all of a sudden it stands upright and it'll have a point sticking straight up. That's because anything that spins like this has what we call angular momentum. Now, that's a fancy scientist word and we can measure it and do all these things. But basically, if something's spinning and it's spinning in a certain direction, then the top of it, the, uh, the point in this top, will always want to stay in the same direction. It'll always want to point up or whatever direction you had it in when you started spinning it. And the Earth is the same way. So I'd like to show you a quick demo of how all of these factors, the fact that the Earth revolves around the sun and that it spins like a top leads to ha us having equinoxes. I'm gonna use these very, very highly technical, sophisticated pieces of equipment that I brought with me. This is going to represent the sun. Uh, it's a clementine and it is also part of my lunch. And we're going to use this to represent the earth. Now, the earth, as you notice, is spinning around and it's spinning around this line here that goes through it. So we call this an axis, the axis of rotation. And the earth is constantly spinning around it. And as the earth spins around like this, the axis always wants to point in the same direction, no matter how the earth moves around. So as the earth moves around the sun, that is always going to point in the exact same direction. So here it's pointing away from the sun. And as it moves over here and then back, now it's pointing towards the sun. Now, if we imagine that this top half of the earth is the northern hemisphere and this bottom half is the southern hemisphere, we can see that at this point, 
no matter how close the Earth is to the sun, right? This half, the top half, as it spins around, is always facing the sun. And then as it moves around over here, it's always facing away from the sun. And as it moves back, it's now facing towards the sun again. So when we are at a point where the axis of the Earth's rotation is pointing directly at the sun, we are getting the most sunlight in the northern hemisphere that we can from the sun. And the sun appears highest in the sky. Right? As we kind of go to a midway point here, now it's pretty much 50-50, right? The Earth's axis of rotation is pointing this way, but it's 50-50. And this is when we get an equinox. And then over here, when the Earth is over here, and it's pointing away from the sun. This is when we get another uh, solstice, but this is the winter solstice when we have the shortest day in the northern hemisphere. But in the southern hemisphere, our friends in Australia are getting the longest day, their longest day of the year. And that's why the northern hemisphere has winter in December for all the holidays that happen in December. But in the southern hemisphere, they're having summer during December, right? It all has to do with the seasons and the different solstices that we experience. So we now have the tools to understand all of that, that the ancient people who built Stonehenge and other ways to try to understand when things were happening didn't have. And we can show this effect by looking at images of our planet Earth taken from space. And this is one of my favorite images of the Earth. This comes from a spacecraft called Discover. And it was launched specifically to observe the Earth and to observe the health of the Earth. And if you notice, there is this line between night and day, this dark line. And this line moves back and forth. Well, what's happening is that the spacecraft is moving with the Earth and with the tilt. And what we're seeing is the effect of the Earth moving uh, back and forth around the sun, just as we said, and the axis of rotation pointing in different directions giving more, sometimes the northern hemisphere more sun, sometimes the southern hemisphere more sun. Now, we have lots of spacecraft in orbit now. Discover is just one of them. These are all of the instruments that we currently have in space to do nothing but study the sun and its interaction with the Earth around us. And there's one that is actually very close to my heart. It's called SOHO. You can see it. Uh, Coming up, another one is called SDO. So SOHO is a Solar Heliophysics Observer, and SDO is a Solar Dynamics Observer. These are satellites that do nothing but study the sun. So back in the old days, pe uh, people in communities tried to understand what the sun was doing by building stone structures and other tools, but all they could do is predict when there was a solstice or an equinox, or sometimes when there was an eclipse. Now we can do so much more. The spacecraft that I've been working on a lot lately is called, as I said, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And right now I'm showing four telescopes that are mounted on top of this satellite way above the Earth's atmosphere. We actually built those telescopes here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, before we launched them on a rocket out into space from uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida in 2011. Now, why do we have to put these telescopes on the spacecraft and launch it into space? Well, it turns out that our Earth's atmosphere actually protects us from a lot of the radiation that's coming from the sun. Not all of the light coming from the sun is light that you can see. So this is an image of the sun. This image is actually made in light that you could see with your eyes, although never look directly at the sun unless you have protective equipment. But this is what we could see from the ground. But if you launch a spacecraft out into space, all of a sudden you can see all these other colors of light that we can't see here from Earth. And what we have here is an image of the sun taken at the exact same time as the previous image, but now we've superimposed all these different colors of light called extreme ultraviolet light or EUV light. And this light is, comes from material in the sun that is super, super hot, millions of degrees. And this material turns out to be moving in the sun all the time and is very, very dynamic. And all of these different effects and things that you can see on the sun now 
can actually affect us here on Earth, especially our technology. And now I'm going to show you a video of one of my favorite things that happens on the sun. This is a solar flare. And what we're about to see is actually the sun explode, having an explosion. If you look at the upper right, you see this dark thing that just explodes out into the outer atmosphere of the sun. And this is one of the ways that the sun can affect us here on Earth. Whereas you're seeing most of that material fall back to the sun, some of that material flows out into space and can intercept the Earth. When that material intercepts the Earth, it can actually cause problems with our electronics, our satellites, and a lot of other technologies that we currently rely on. Fortunately for us, this one was aimed in another direction away from Earth, and most of the material fell back to the sun where it causes all of these secondary explosions that you see. Now, it is my job as a scientist to look at images like this and take all of the data and information from them and try to understand how these explosions and other processes on the sun actually work, how they actually combine together, and how all of them work together to influence life here on Earth as well as understand the sun. So we've gone from ancient days where people tried to understand when they could plant their crops by building tools to determine when the sun was going to be high in the sky or low in the sky, determine when summer was coming or fall was coming, to actually trying to understand how the sun itself works through satellites that we launch into space to specifically look at our local star. So you might be wondering, with all these amazing technologies that we have to study the sun, why do we still care about solstices? When we have technologies that allow us to tell time amazingly accurately, and even for New England weather, I can tell whether or not it's going to rain today just by asking Siri. Why do we care if the sun is higher or lower in the sky? And the answer I've always come to is this. I care about it because I decide to care about it. I think the solstices are a great time to sit back and think and remind myself that time passes. The picture that you're seeing now is actually a picture I took on a hiking trip up in the Colorado mountains with a good friend of mine. And that friend always celebrated the solstices and the equinoxes just to remind themselves that time was short and that you should enjoy it. This was the last trip I ever got to take with that friend. And now I use the solstice as a time to remind me of that friend who's now gone and to make sure that I am marking the passage of my life as well as every day-to-day -day task. So I'd use it as a time to think about where I'm at in my life and to think about the season that is to come. And with that, I'm going to end my talk. I've uh, put a list of resources on this talk. If you want to learn more about the sun, if you want to learn more about any of the images I've shown during this talk, feel free to use any of the links here. If you have any questions, you can send me an email. My email address is trae at arisalab.org. And you can send me an email and ask me any question you like. And with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, Trey. Hello, Diana. Happy solstice. How Happy are you? Solstice. I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. I've, I've got my um, <laughs> flower crown on. I'm um, so intensely jealous. <laughs> this is what we do at um, our, our regular on-site summer solstice celebration, but since we can't have it on campus, well, we're, we're all doing our flower crowns at home, and I have to say that my family made this one for me. It's a little bit fancy, but maybe later I'll, I'll try on different things. But everyone is welcome to make their own flower crown so they can celebrate at home or when they go outdoors after the program. So Trey, we're going to um, take some questions from the audience watching today. And we have staff members behind the scenes sending the questions. And I will just um, give those to you. I do have a few already. So the first question is, why does a summer solstice fall on a different day every year? Oh, okay, well, that's a, that's a great question. And there's actually a couple of different things that work together so that, you know, the solstice is about the same time of the year, but not always on the exact same day. First off, you know, in my talk, I mentioned that the uh, Earth has almost a perfect circular orbit around the sun. Well, almost perfect, right? There's no such thing as perfect, right? And the, the 
orbit of the Earth is a little bit smushed, just a little bit. So yeah, it actually, you know, the orbit of the Earth as it goes around is not necessarily perfect. So, you know, it can change up the timing a little bit. But mainly it's because the way that we humans measure time is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, there are lots of ancient cultures and, you know, some people today still use a lunar calendar rather than a solar calendar. So they define uh, the passage of time by new moon to new moon, whereas the calendars that we base our system on now we're actually based on solstice to solstice and equinox to equinox. Problem is that the universe doesn't really care about when December falls, right? And our way of keeping time isn't perfect. A day, you always hear a day is 24 hours long. It's not quite, it's 24 hours and a bit. And we have no way of keeping up with all the and a bits that uh, creep up in our timekeeping system. That's one of the reasons why we have leap years every four years. Our system of measuring time is suited for us, but not necessarily the universe around us. So you have to actually gauge and know when these cycles of the universe are happening to know when it's going to, uh, when that day is going to fall on this arbitrary calendar system that we've decided upon. And it's, you know, this way for us here on Earth, it would be different if we were on other planets such as Mars, Venus, Mercury, right? So basically the way that you have, the way that you keep your time is a choice, but the way the universe works is not a choice that we have. So we just make our systems adapt the best we can. Thank you, Trey. Um, I think lately everyone has been, uh, it feels as though time is going by so quickly. And sometimes for some reason, it's just even hard to keep track of the days. Um, I have another question. Um, how did you become interested in astrophysics? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I know I'm supposed to say I was inspired by all the great scientists that came before, you know, Madame Curie, Einstein, all that. But if I'm going to be truthful, I am of a specific generation that went to go see Star Wars as one of our first movies. And I remember just seeing these spaceships coming across the screen and I thought they were real and I wanted to live in that world. And um, I realized early on that the technology didn't exist to make those sorts of things yet. I wanted a Millennium Falcon so bad, um, but there's no hyperdrive, there's, there's no ion drive at the time. Now there is actually an ion drive. Um, and I learned kind of early as a student that you know, basically engineers take all the things that are known to build new structures and to design new things. But scientists are the ones that actually study space and study how the universe works in order to come up with a new understanding of the universe that will allow engineers to make new things. And for me, that was like, oh, well, if I want something that doesn't exist, right, I'm going to have to discover how to make it. Discovery is the job of a scientist. Also, too, early on in my science fiction past, I noticed I was always Mr. Spock that really saved the Enterprise. <laughs> and Kirk just kind of hung around and looked cool and started fist fights. So I was always a little bit more of a Spock than a Kirk and just thought that was a natural progression. And I've got to say, my natural bent is I just like solving problems. I like solving puzzles. I like, I don't think of things as problems. I think of them as challenges to be solved. And how do you take all these different bits and pieces of things that you know and put them together in new ways to make unique solutions to challenges? And a lot of that is the job of a scientist. We have to use the tools that we've got to discover new things. My study of the sun is actually all about using what you've got and what tools you have on hand to do things to learn about an object that's 93 million miles away. We don't get to go and put a thermometer in the sun. We don't get to go and uh, take a scoop of star stuff and put it in a lab and, you know, have beakers and stuff. All we really get is the light from the sun and all these different particles. So that's a challenge. And so you start thinking about, okay, well, how can I study light in all these different ways to learn things about how hot the sun is, how, what it's made of, uh, what the magnetic fields look like and how they're constantly changing. And that kind of constant having to think up of new solutions actually is, I find to be very exciting. Yes, 
Thank you. So I bet that there are a lot of uh, kids watching, uh, or at least I hope so, maybe with their parents or maybe by themselves. So they might want to know, um, do you need to be really good at math to excel in your field? Yeah, so that's a great question. One of the things that you learn early on is that mathematics is the language of the universe. Right? The universe works in ways that can be understood by math. But I gotta say, when I was you know, growing up, I was not really the best math student. Um, I really, I knew that math was something that I was going to have to learn if I wanted to do what I wanted to do. But I always found it challenging, right? And I think a lot of people think that if you're not like innately good at math, if you're not just some math genius that just gets it, then you know science is not something for you. And that's completely wrong, right? Science is for anybody. And just like anything else, you just have to work at it. And one of the most transformational things I learned, I went to this talk and they were talking about how people actually learn stuff. And we, nobody, and very few people understand that our brains are designed so that we already think we know everything, right? Uh, I already think I know a lot about you. I already think I know a lot about how my car works. My brain just fills in the gaps and the brain gets it wrong a lot of the time. And whenever you're learning something new, it's not filling an empty space. It's actually taking out, physically removing all of the uh, misinformation that you have in your brain and replacing it with new correct information. Right? And that is a physical process, right? Our brains are physical things. And that physical process has a physical sensation. And that sensation is frustration. And when I learned that every time I was getting frustrated with the topic, whenever I was like having a hard time and feeling like I couldn't do it and just, you know, all those emotions and feel, physical feelings that come along with frustration, well, I realized that that actually meant that I was on the cusp of learning something new that it was like a bodybuilder working out their muscles and feeling that burn in the muscles before it got bigger. As soon as I realized that, everything opened up to me. And I started looking forward to actually leaning into those frustrations. And it's like, oh, I'm getting frustrated by this. This means I'm about to learn it. I'm about to get something new. And that is one of the things that actually got me through graduate school, which is very, very challenging. You're hit with a lot of stuff at once. And, you know, a lot of times I was, a, you know, a minus B plus student, but I just never gave up. I leaned into every bit of the frustration and I worked hard and kept on trying to do the things that I thought was important, listen to all of my colleagues and stuff like that. And now I have what I think is a very successful scientific career. I love what I'm doing. I actually get to work with spaceships in orbit. And going back to my Star Wars fascination, when I was in graduate school, I got paid to fly satellites around the sun, and my best friend was a brown furry dog named Chewy. So I think that you don't have to be great at math, because I wasn't. And man, living the dream. Thank you. So I now have uh, a few questions from the public. Uh, Susan asks, and I think this refers to you to the last video you showed, does mm -hmm. solar debris come in and make the solar storms bigger? Ah, so there's lots, people keep on saying that the space is a vacuum and that's pretty much true, right? Space has, space has a whole lot of nothing in it, but there is stuff in space and it depends on what you talk about, what you mean when you say debris. Now in that last video, what I showed was, uh, a, it's called a failed filament eruption. Right, filaments, all that dark stuff that you saw it kind of launching off. And when it goes up, right, it kind of goes in hands. And then anything that escapes from the sun is called the coronal mass ejection. So the corona is that outer atmosphere of the sun and it ejects mass. Therefore, we call it a coronal mass ejection because we're not great at names. So, anyway, when that coronal mass ejection comes in and interacts with the earth, it's really it's spread out and it's still super thin. It's super hot, but super thin. And all of the energy really isn't in the speed of the stuff and the mass, it's not like a bullet. All of the energy is actually in the magnetic fields that are contained in that ejection, right? So the things that cause solar storms here on earth really isn't physical stuff. It's the physical stuff carrying magnetic fields from the sun primarily, 
and interacting with the magnetic field of the earth. And in the, it, almost the exact same way that generators generate electricity using magnets and copper wire, the uh, forces of magnetic fields from the sun hitting us via CMEs and the magnetic field of the earth and those magnetic fields changing as they interact causes electric fields here. Now there is debris in space. In fact, we have, uh, the human race is litter bugs when it comes to uh, low earth orbit. And there's a lot of physical debris sitting around in space. Um, that does not so much cause solar storms or things that we have to worry about. It does impact our technology and the fact that anything floating around in orbits where there is the International Space Station or uh, GPS uh, satellites, communication satellites, right? We all, if you're in the greater Boston area, you, if you haven't lived here all your life, you rely on GPS to know how to get anywhere because this place was designed on a dare. Right, nothing's you know north south. Nothing's lined up. I don't know where anything is without Siri telling me you know where to get somewhere. All of those are vulnerable both to the solar storms from CMEs, like I talked about, but the debris, the actual physical bits of metal, paint, um, just garbage that's been left over uh, sixty years of exploring uh, low Earth orbit. Actually, they're like little bitty bullets, right? And they um, and all of these satellites are designed to be very light. So they have a very thin skin and these little bits of metal, some you know, smaller than my pinky finger can actually tear holes through all of these pieces of equipment. And in fact, the windows of the International Space Station, a few of them show very thick cracks from where they were hit by, uh, bits, of these by bits of debris. So it's a very different thing, but they're both things that we have to be uh, careful of and watch and monitor. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Jennifer. I have read that the tilt of the earth has changed and is greater. Does this affect this solstice timing? Yeah, so that's actually a great question. It, uh, it, it will actually impact the um, severity of the solstice. But I will say that, you know, the earth's tilt, the earth's got a little bit of a wobble to it, right? It's got a little bit of a back and forth. Again, nothing is perfect in this universe. And if you spin a top, right, it doesn't specifically, that point doesn't specifically point up. There's a bit of a wobble to it. So, you know, these are effects that um, could add up over the history of the human race. No, uh, because these are very slight effects. Over the history of the entire Earth, Sun, solar system, and our eventual future, yes, that they do add up. But it's not something that in our historical record we're really ever going to notice. Now, one thing that we have noticed is that due to the imperfection in the circular orbit of the Earth and all these different factors working together, what we see different stars now in the night sky at the same time than we would have several hundred years ago. And uh, I always have to explain pe to people that astronomy is not astrology. Uh, one has predictive power, the other is astrology. And the, um, I don't really know star signs and stuff like that because it's not part of my job. But the one thing I do know is that when uh, astrologers came up with their ways of determining when uh, different houses uh, were in, uh, were, or when um, different star signs were in the house of the sun, right? Everything is shifted over at least one star sign, right? So if you're supposedly an Aries, you're no longer an Aries, you're something else. And there's actually a 13th zodiac sign, but since they tried to make it match up with the 12 year calendar, nothing really quite fits. So yes, things do change over time periods that the human race can actually measure. And this is one of those effects. The effect of the uh, changing of the earth's tilt over time, you know, that's actually a minor effect and you have to have very sophisticated equipment to actually measure that change. And it doesn't really affect the timing of the solstice. One thing that we can measure and change, which I always think is kind of cool, is um, when we landed on the moon, we actually put a reflector on the moon. And ever since we put the reflector on the moon, NASA has been sending little laser pulses to hit that reflector and then send it back. And that gives us a very good measurement of the distance of the earth and the moon. And we can actually me measure how quickly the moon is moving away from the earth. Now, it is less than a centimeter per year, right? It's very small, you're, you're not gonna answer. But it, what that means is that in a hundred years or so, 
we are no longer going to have total solar eclipses. And eclipses is one of the things that I enjoy, I study, I use it in a lot of my outreach work. And we're in a very specific period of time with a very specific earth moon system where everything just lines up so that we can have a total solar eclipse. And that uh, condition will not last forever. It, in fact, in several hundred years, no more solar eclipses. So again, just to relate that back to the solstice is one of these things that I always use to uh, remember that time passes, that things change, that you move from one season to the next and you should always appreciate the season you're in. And I am now appreciating that I live in a time where solar eclipses actually happen. Thank you, Trey. Um, we have a question from Yushuan. Google says, Hi, Google says that the solstice will be reached today at 5.43 p.m. EST. Mm. How is this time determined and what does it mean? Yeah, that is actually a great question. And I am going to be a good scientist. And here's uh, what a good scientist uh, often says. I don't know the exact answer to that. Right? You always have to be willing to admit what you don't know. I will say this, that that timing of the exact time of the solstice, again, is somewhat arbitrary. Um, basically, a solstice happens for the person experiencing it at a local noon, right? So here in the Eastern time zone where I'm having, the solstice actually happens, the uh, sun hits that maximum point in its arc you know, at my local about noon, right? In fact, that's how noon was defined. Every city used to have its own noon, and that was when the sun was at the top part of uh, its daily uh, motion across the uh, sky. So why this one time? Well, I honestly, I don't have a, a great answer for that, and I'm sorry. Uh, you can probably look it up on the American Astronomical Society uh, website, or uh, I would also recommend the Astronomy Society of the Specific. Uh, they actually are a group of amateur astronomers who actually love researching these things in detail and uh, promoting astronomy by giving information on things like this. I will say that it is probably just an arbitrary date that a timekeeping system or a group like the International Astronomy Union um, made based on some science, based on something, but in the grand scheme of things, just with the way that we measure time uh, in general, doesn't really matter. Um, it, probably does for a specific purpose that one person or a small group of people have. Uh, for you, what does it matter? I, I would say not so much. And in all the research, and I've been doing solar physics research for the last quarter of a century now, um, I will say it matters to me so much that I've not bothered to learn why it's actually at this time. So maybe that tells you what you need to know. So we have another time-related question from yeah. Fabio. He asks, have days always been 24 hours in length? Oh, that's a great question. The days are currently not 24 hours in length. They are 24 hours in a bit, uh, which is, causes a uh, havoc with uh, clockmakers and uh, other people for many, many years. Uh, in fact, the hardest thing you can do in programming is actually come up with a consistent way to measure time that translates time from one uh, way to measure it to another because everybody has got these different ways of handling um, these extra bits of a day and stuff. Uh, now, it is true that actually the, um, the uh, time period of the days, uh, they do, it has changed over millions and millions of years uh, by very little. Um, the Earth has this thing called angular momentum, which I talked a little bit about. You know, it spins and um, there is a uh, point where it always wants to go up and it has this inertia. It always kind of wants to go at the same rate unless there's some frictional force that actually slows down the, that rate of spin, right? It has to somehow shed that angular momentum to other places, right? So it has to you know, get rid of that excess energy. And there's a couple of different ways that it can do that. Um, you know, there are actually interactions with the magnetic field of the sun. We've actually found that other stars, you know, so stars also rotate and it's that rotation that causes our day night cycle. We found that stars, we can measure now how much they slow down 
because their magnetic fields that they put out into their own systems of planets actually acts as a braking mechanism that slows them down. So there are some mechanisms that will actually allow for the planet to slow down and that slowing down of the spin will cause the uh, day and time to change. However, I'll say that over the most of human recorded history is not changed to any appreciable level. It's not expected to change any level in any foreseeable time frame. But in the next thousand, two thousand years, yes, we will actually be able to have measurements showing how much the Earth has slowed down its spin, and that would make the day-night cycle longer. So days and nights would actually be longer than twenty-four hours. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark would like to know if the solstice is different between north and south. Is there no solstice if you are in the middle? Ah, that is a. Great I imagine question. that's in the equator. Is that? I that think? would be right at the equator. And yeah, that is actually a great uh, question. It, uh, there is actually a little bit of one, but not so much. You, you don't notice that much of a change, right? And that's why the equator um, is this important point because it doesn't really have seasons. You know, the, we have this winter solstice and a summer solstice, right? Because we're far away from the equator. In fact, the farther away from the equator, the more pronounced the solstice gets. Uh, if you go to the North Pole or the South Pole, basically um, your solstice, right? Your summer solstice is when you see the sun, right? It just comes over that line and it's the highest point. And then you have like a season of sunlight and then a season of darkness, right? So your winter, the sun doesn't come up above the horizon at all. The, around the equator, you have almost a, a permanent equinox, right? The sun doesn't seem to change that much. It does, you can't actually measure the changes, but, but they're very, very small. Okay, excellent. So we have um, a few minutes left. Uh, there are a few questions related uh, to the sun, of course. Um, first one from Marilyn, how does the sun make the explosions? And Jan also wants to know, how long will our sun live? How will it change? Yeah. Hi, Jan. All right, so those are great questions. And um, I love solar flares and I wish I prepared a little bit more for that question because I've got a great demo for it. But basically these explosions that happen on the sun, these solar flares, I love the eruptive events that I study on the sun, happen for the uh, very similar reason. And that is magnetic fields can store energy. Now magnetic fields we think of in the earth as being very regular and not changing. There's a North Pole and the South Pole. The sun actually goes through this period of time where it gets to be very, very active. And when it's active, the sun can have millions upon millions of North Poles and South Pole pairs. And it gets all tangled and it gets all messy, right? And what happens is that um, the magnetic fields have a lot in common with rubber bands. And if you can imagine twisting up a rubber band and just stretching and stretching and stretching, eventually it snaps. And when the rubber band snaps, it releases a lot of energy very, very quickly. So you can stretch and stretch and stretch the rubber band over a long period of time. But when it snaps, all of the energy that you put into that rubber band is immediately released. And that exact same property is what causes solar flares, right? The magnetic fields are just stretched beyond uh, their, uh, any point where they can actually stay connected in the way that they are. And they snap, but unlike rubber bands, it's magnetic can't have these free floating ends, magnetic fields always have to reattach. They always have to be a perfect loop. And so they reconnect in new places uh, where they are lower energy. So um, this process we call reconnection because again, scientists not great at names, we call them like we see them. It's a reconnection of them because it's snapped, it's stressed, snapped, and then reconnect where it's less stressed. But all that energy's gotta go somewhere. And that usually goes up into heating all the material of the sun, throwing stuff from the sun and uh, interacting with the earth in that way. Now, as far as how old is the sun uh, and how much time we've got, the sun has been about the same way for you know, about 14 billion years and we've got about another 4 billion to go. So on your list of things to worry about, the sun going out's not one of them. I always tell people, it's like, when is the sun going out? When are these things going to happen? And I say, be more careful 
uh, getting out of the bathtub because that's how most people die. Don't smoke, uh, jog a little bit, eat some vegetables. That's how you, uh, those are the things you should be concerned with. The sun has got a lot of life left into it. It's got plenty of fuel to keep on going. Uh, when it does actually start to reach the limits of its fuel, what it's going to do is actually expand out. And we, can, we know this because we see it, we've seen it happen in other stars. And when it happens in other stars, we see that it's used a lot of its fuel and all of a sudden uh, it starts to expand out into what we call a red giant. And the sun will actually become, when it hits this red giant phase, it'll be large enough that it'll actually be larger than the orbit of the earth around it. So the sun will basically eat up the earth at this time, right? Again, <laughs> billions of years away, you know, just monitor your heart rate and, you know, don't smoke. You know, you, that's what, you know, you, you don't have to worry about that, but that is the life of our local star. It's not uh, large enough to become a, a black hole. It's not large enough to become a white dwarf. It's just going to go through this natural expansion and then kind of cool off. All right, thank you. Um, I appreciate you being with us today, uh, Trey. I hope you have a wonderful summer solstice and I hope to see you again soon in, hey, this has been a lot in of person. Fun. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to seeing you in person. Thank you, Trey.